Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Gerald Grunwald, Dean of the Jefferson College of Life Sciences. And on behalf of our college, it is my pleasure to welcome our Textile, Philadelphia University, and Jefferson alumni, as well as our additional guests and current students, faculty, and staff to the latest in our series of events during our ongoing Jefferson College of Life Sciences anniversary celebration. Tonight, we are here to honor and to hear from Ms. Joanna Mercado, the 2021 recipient of the JCLS Alumni Association's Early Career Alumni Award. Joanna, we are very proud of you and your accomplishments, and we look forward to hearing you share the story of your journey with us about your time as our student and now as our alumnus. As everyone will learn in a moment when she is fully introduced, Joanna Mercado is a graduate of our college's Human Genetics and Genetic Counseling Program, and it was my pleasure to get to know Joanna during her time as our student and to engage with her and her fellow students as an instructor in her courses. It is always especially rewarding to follow the ongoing success of our former students. And again, I congratulate Joanna on her accomplishments and look forward to her presentation. I also want to extend my thanks to the JCLS Alumni Association Board, to our Office of Alumni Affairs, and to Assistant Vice President for Alumni Relations, Jeffrey Spence, for supporting tonight's event, and of course, to all of our alumni for your dedication and support of our university, college, programs, students, and faculty. It is now my pleasure to turn the screen over to our master's program in human genetics and genetic counseling co-directors, Rachel Brandt and Zora Ali Konkatz, who will introduce our awardee. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to introduce Joanna Mercado, the recipient of the Early Career Alumni Award. Joanna graduated in 2019 as a member of the inaugural class of the Human Genetics and Genetic Counseling Program. Both Rachel Brandt and I are co-directors of this program. From the moment we met Joanna at her in applicant interview, we knew the field of genetic counseling needed her. We were drawn to Joanna's kindness, her perspective, her ability to reflect on difficult situations and not just want change, but to see how she could be a part of the solution. In the classroom, Joanna's work ethic, spirit, and positivity was infectious. As members of a new program, students had to roll with the punches, both expected and unexpected, as our program developed. Joanna was eager to contribute ideas, to try out new opportunities, and to forge paths into the unknown territory, not just on behalf of the program, but for her personal growth. She was the person who cheered both and consoled her classmates and accepted their support as well. Ever honest with herself and others, she was the glue of the group and we will be ever grateful for her contributions. Upon graduation, Joanna landed her dream job, working as a genetic counselor at the prestigious Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and taking her strong work ethic into this role. True to herself, Joanna became involved in the field. She found herself wanting to build upon her skills and to make a difference. Recognizing the need for access to genetic counseling services for people of all abilities and backgrounds, Joanna recently accepted a position with Genome Medical, a company that strives to reach patients through virtual care and technology. In this role, Joanna also serves, I'm, I'm sorry, in addition to this role, <laughs> Joanna also serves as the co-director of the Anti-Racism Subcommittee of the Genomic Technology Special Interest Group of the National Society of Genetic Counselors. The genetic counseling field has been dominated by Caucasian women since its inception, and while some strides have been made to increase diversity, the profession remains largely homogenous. In leading this group, Joanna works on decreasing barriers in genetics by promoting justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Joanna and her fellow co-chair have been able to collaborate with several genetic counselors, along with the student-led organization, Genetic Counseling Training Platform for Racial Justice, to build a framework of incorporating diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in education, research, recruitment, and active community outreach. We could not be more proud of Joanna's accomplishments to date, and we look forward to what she will bring to the genetic counseling profession in the future. Um, so first and foremost, I wanna certainly thank Dr. Grunwald and Jeff and Rachel and Zor for this unique opportunity and allowing me to share my work thus far within 
the diversity, equity, and inclusion justice community. And I want to start off with a timeline, a brief timeline, I would say, um, in regards to um, what I've done so far in my career path and highlight, um, I mainly highlight that I was not a traditional student when entering the genetic counseling field. And I didn't learn about the field of genetic counseling until I attended a tumor board meeting while working as a research assistant. And I'm certainly glad and grateful for that moment because it certainly sparked a fire in me and allowed me to you know, proceed in my career path and very thankful to have been given the, the opportunity to have been part of the inaugural class at um, JCLS. Um, and it certainly has helped shape me, my experience there um, into being the genetic counselor that I am today. Um, and I would say before becoming, you know, a, a mentor with Minority Genetic Professionals Network and being co-chair of the anti-racism subcommittee, um, I want to quickly, I would say, bring people back to, I would say, one of the best lectures I had attended while at JCLS. Um, and it was a lecture during my second year with Dr. Don um, Trahan, who guest lectured a talk on DEI. And his lecture was so captivating to me. Not only did he use illustrations to help guide the discussion with the group, but he certainly, with his passion and call to action with society, really resonated with me. And, and how else can we as individuals, you know, becoming genetic counselors, how can we, once we enter this career, um, make changes that are, are needed? Um, it was even in my experience, um, with, at JCLS when I also was able to uh, do a rotation in Argentina where I had learned the different inequities, not only that individuals certainly face in the United States, but in other countries. And I thought, you know, change is needed no, ma no matter where we are. And it my experience there certainly resonated with me as well. Um, but, you know, before getting into anything else, I do want to uh, highlight, I guess, a picture. And and I kind of was inspired by Dr. Trahan in regards to that, because he used certainly, as I said, illustrations to help um, with the discussion. And I wanted to show this picture, because I would say, and, and as other people say, most certainly that a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, oh no, it's not going. There we go. Um, so, this picture here highlights um, four different terms that society faces. Um, we have inequality, which is an unequal distribution and access to different opportunities. While equality distributes tools to everyone, yet not everyone starts from the same vantage point. Where equity certainly gives tools to allow people to have their own starting point to address the inequities that they may face and justice fixing the systems that are existing in, in our current place and offering equal opportunity and access. Yet in the reality of the society we live in, this is what the majority of, of individuals face. And we have to strive most certainly to reach that level of equity and justice. And it was a couple of days ago, actually, um, the Vice President um, Harris, um, I felt like, really um, her comment during a, uh, when her, she had spoken in regards to um, the, the recent trial and uh, with, Dr. with uh, Mr. Chauvin and George Floyd. Um, and I think that this really depicts the, the in a, the, what our societies face right now and it's a measure of justice isn't the same as equal justice. Um, and I think we as individuals have to strive for a system of equity and justice, most definitely. These examples of inequities lie even within the terms that we use at, on a frequent basis, especially even in medicine and in genetics. And we have race, ethnicity, and ancestry. Both race and ethnicity are social constructs. They divide groups of people based on whether it be um, you know, their physical traits to religion, to sociocultural and psychological and behavior components. Um, 
And it's aimed to divide people into certain categories of being Black, Asian, Native American, Latino, and white groups. Whereas ancestry refers to lines of descent in genomic structure among different populations, depending on ancestry. Yet even the use of um, ancestry and genomics, it hasn't been the best uh, descriptions, I would say, or representation of individuals, particularly with people of color. There was a study published in 2016 in Nature, and they noted that samples of European origins have the most specific description of population ancestry. Whereas you can see that, that there was 26 terms, including black cases and sub-Saharan African cases that were used to describe people of African ancestry. And it is with these inequities, and not only certainly with the use of ancestry, but also with the use of race. And race itself has played a role in hierarchical rankings, eugenics, and justifications of genocide, colonialism, slavery, and other social inequities. It is with the social constructs of race and ethnicity, along with other factors that certainly contribute to the current health disparities that we face um, within the US healthcare system. And certainly other determinants um, co that contribute are certainly language, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, so socioeconomic status of an individual, healthcare, whether it be the type of healthcare someone has or whether this individual has insurance or not, to education, attainment, national origin, the ability, status, and age, and their location. And we can all see these disparities certainly existing in the area of oncology from cancer treatment to prevention to research, our underrepresented communities are faced with many barriers. You know, with cancer treatment, we can see, you know, disparities in regards to access to pain management, to utilization of surgery and radiation therapy, to the uptake of clinical trial participation. Whereas we see with cancer prevention, African-American men are less likely to obtain colorectal cancer screenings compared to other groups, as well as even the utilization of genetic testing. Studies have shown with, B, even with just BRCA1 and 2 testing, the uptake of, of Black women is much lower than white women, and that's even after adjusting for, for provider recommendation, the cost of genetic testing and ascertainment bias, to even with cancer research, the need for needing for individuals of, of diverse backgrounds to be engaged in research efforts. And we all know in regards to cancer research that there's a lack and in limited information of representation within our genomic databases that's attributing to our lack of knowledge in regards to cancer biology for underserved populations, which could potentially guide their treatment, but we don't have enough information. With, and it's with all of these factors, I would say they certainly contribute to this graph right here. And you can see that this study that was recently published in 2020 in Nature shows that in the United States between 2010 and 2016, the white people who had cancer are more likely to survive for five years after their diagnosis than people of any other race. And this is something that we have to consider and make changes towards. And not only, I would say, that we see these disparities occurring in cancer, we can also see the, the nation face health inequities. We also saw and still are experiencing the health inequities that are faced by COVID-19. An individual faces risks and inequities of both cancer and COVID, depending on, but not limited to, socioeconomic disparities from the level of their income to employment, level of medical insurance, as I alluded to earlier, from housing and location to their level of education to lifestyle factors such as alcohol consumption, tobacco use, and diet and obesity, along with reduced access to medical care, fear of participation in clinical trials, to the high risk of acquiring disease and the high risk of death from disease. There was a study recently published this year, um, actually, and it, it looked at um, 10,000 beneficiaries um, from ages 46 to uh, 64. Um, and they looked solely at individuals who identified as being African-American or Hispanic and Latino. 
And what they were able to identify was that the median uh, screening rate of mammographies um, were about 8.7 to 8.1 women per these, these 10,000 beneficiaries. Um, and this was a 96% decline in, in mammography screening. And the same was seen with colonoscopy screenings where we, we saw a major decrease to 95%. And although we currently do not yet know um, how much of a decline in cancer screening during the pandemic has attributed to the number of cancers diagnosed in 2020 and 2021 and moving forward, there's certainly work that needs to be done in regards to that. Um, but we can at least say that likely given disparities known prior to, to COVID-19 and the effects of these disparities that already attributed to the differences in the five-year survival rate that this delay in the diagnoses for these individuals because of the decline screenings and the stages of which these cancers were diagnosed during the pandemic, I'm sure this gap will likely be bigger in the future. Yet as much as there's a lack of diversity, equity, and justice, um, and inclusions are seen within the care of our patients, even, even in medical research, um, the differences are also presented in our workforce as Rachel was certainly alluding to earlier. Every year, the National Society of Genetic Counselors administers an annual survey, a professional status survey. Um, and it was last year's survey that highlighted um, the respondents that 90% uh, were white Caucasian individuals, um, while 5% were Asian, 3% um, were Asian Indian, 2% were Hispanic or Latino, as well as 2% only being Black and African American. Um, and it, and as you can tell, you know, the percentage is seen on the respondents that are of the individuals in the field of genetic counseling. Um, they do not represent um, our, pop, our society or, or our patients even. And it's something that we have to create a systemic change within our workforce research and our patients. And I would say it was the events within 2020, most certainly, particularly with the killing of, of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor that sparked, I would say, um, the fire within NSGC and, and, and other individuals, certainly me, myself, were, were, was motivated um, to create and initiate a change within the field itself. Um, and it was an, another genetic counselor and I, Ethel Vig, who had decided together that we should co-chair um, this anti-racism subcommittee within the National Society of Genetic Counselors, specifically with the Genomic Technology Special Interest Group. And it was after extensive time and research of papers and other work that's been done within the field that we were able to create this framework together um, called ERA, which stands for Education, Training, Research and Recruitment and Active Outreach. And this was a framework that we're hoping that's a suggested framework, I should say, as a call out or call to action for unity within the professionals, the genetic counselor professions and other healthcare professionals to help improve the usage and access, particularly with um, genomic technologies and equitable, I would say, dissemination of genomic information across all individuals. Highlighting with the concept of education and, and, train, and training, I think it's important that we begin with the, with the inception of an individual entering and learning about the field of genetic counseling. Um, and starts with you know, implementing the change within the individual genetic counseling training program and education system to achieve not only cross-cultural competency, but be able to reflect diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice efforts. And by also incorporating and learning from frameworks of other healthcare professionals across academia and industry as well. Whilst also importantly, utilizing already existing workshops with our clinical rotation supervisors to reflect DEIJ efforts and cultural competency so that this will allow students to mirror appropriate culturally competent practices. And also, most at least, most importantly, as well as um, being able to diversify our application pool, because by diversifying our application pool, we'll certainly eventually be able to diversify our workforce. In order to 
create a more diverse workforce, we have to be able to develop and support different perspectives and insights from initiating early exposure for students to from hosting webinars and, and events such as career days on the area of genetic counseling um, to, you know, and especially, you know, to working with training programs to connect not only undergraduate programs, but certainly with graduate programs as well. And this is especially most importantly can be utilized um, with genetic counseling programs that already exist at institutes that provide both undergraduate and graduate studies, along with ensuring that we're able, not only training career development, but also supporting this career development for individuals interested in the area of genetics from guiding individuals to applying internships to also you know, creating internships, the opportunity for individuals to apply as well as observerships along with guiding individuals for scholarships. And at the same time, while we're leading and supporting these individuals through this career path, it is important that we self-reflect on our efforts to create changes and improvements. And it's only it's, it's imperative to also be able to incorporate feedback from individuals, especially students from those that are, are from underrepresented communities who in the past have previously not experienced equity and inclusion and using these ways to help improve the system by either hosting focus groups and certainly with surveys to, to help in, um, you know, help this uh, career path overall. And as important it is to in regards to recruiting and diversifying our application, applicant pool and workforce, we also need to do the same when it comes to research. Um, you know, there are our his the history overall in regards to medicine, you know, it's quite infamous in regards to the exploitation of minority groups in medicine and research that has resulted in a, a major mistrust in the healthcare system by certain, by, by certain groups, most, most, most certainly. And although there certainly have been recent efforts, I would say, in attempting to address these issues by prioritizing funding and targeting projects, trying to create inclusis, inclusivity of up un, underrepresented populations, and, and particularly with the NIH All of Us Research Program, we still need to work on building trust within a community. And this is key to improving engagement, most certainly, um, and, and not only engagement, but also enrollment in research and clinical care overall. And it's uh, with this trust of the healthcare team that this will only arise if the team is transparent um, and becomes involved with the community themselves. And this requires most certainly being clear and accurate and having, I would say, clear and accurate communication of the risks and benefits of, spe uh, of specific treatment to even research protocols that are, are trials that we're discussing with our patients um, and being very specific with the, with, you know, in detail with the community to help build that relationship and that trust with our, our community, but as well as the community leaders too. Along with certainly with, um, which certainly leads me to um, active outreach um, in the community. And we have to constantly be engaged and consult with our communities before and after completion of recruitment and research. We have to be able to create clear and explicit discussions with our, you know, with local community advisory groups to review not only goals, but certainly updates of the projects as they move along and results as we as they come across and to the point of, you know, how this work has led to publications, um, as well as developing culturally appropriate um, education sessions and even materials for and with the community members about the research and the genetic and genetics overall. Well, even certainly being able to um, support our community members to either co-author with public for public with publication on publications and co-present at conferences as well, as well as distributing updates and results to members of the community in a way that's understandable, whether it be issuing pamphlets or you know month, certain newsletters, whether it be monthly or quarterly, to updating thing you know information through social media providing presentations at community events um, 
even in you know certain meetings that are held at certain high schools to help engage the community and keep them informed and being transparent about everything going on within the research project itself. Um, and I know there's a lot of work that needs to be done still. And me and other genetic counselors that have worked with me um, on this framework are working to gain recognition, most certainly right now, on this call to action and unity to allow this framework to be implemented in other er in other aspects or areas within the field of genetic counseling. And I hope that this suggested framework um, will help improve the usage and access to genetic technology and, and services altogether and be able to provide equitable um, care and distribution of the genomic information across, as I said, all individuals. And I leave everyone with this quote um, as a food for thought, I would say, um, by Dr. Kendi, um, who's a renowned speaker and national um, book award winner. And he's also the director of BU Center for Anti-Racism Research. And two days ago when the verdict was read for Mr. Chauvin um, for the death of Mr. Floyd, um, he said the immense effort it took, including a historical level of protests for millions of people in 2020 for a single case points to larger systemic issues. Only by changing racist policies will black people and other victims of brutality begin to do what was denied by George Floyd. Brief. Thank you again, everyone. Um, and um, I appreciate the time. <laughs> but thank you for your very informative and enlightening presentation and the work that you're doing in the field um, to really expand uh, the inclusion and diversity of, of scientists. I'm sure that there are many questions from our attendees, and so I invite you to share your questions using the Q&A button located on your screen. And we have received a few already, so um, if you're ready, we'll, we'll get started. So the first is, that, Joanna, if you could think and, and reflect a little bit on what are some of the challenges that that you have personally faced in your education, in your career, um, and then how are some do you think related or unique to your your identity as a Latinx professional? Um, I mean, I I wanted to get in the be, become part of or enter the area of medicine just because. You know, growing up, I've certainly learned about different barriers that individuals may face, especially if English is not someone's first language or if based on their national origin as well. Um, and, you know, as I, as I, you know, continue in regards to providing patient care and I, I do what's best for patients, not for myself. And I think that's something that I, I don't, um, I don't prioritize myself over any, any, like over my patients. Um, I do what's comfort, comfortable for them. Um, but as a, perf I guess that was a loaded question. I'm still trying to process it. <laughs> do you, <laughs> um, I mean, have I, have I personally faced any, um, adversities? Um, I mean, as growing up as, a minority, I think everyone can say that they have to some degree and some level, but as a professional, no, I have not. Um, as an individual, yes, I've certainly had certain comments, but not as a professional. Sure. Well, thank you for that. Um, one of the questions that we received is, you know, what advice would you give to young women looking to get into the field? Well, um, I would say that there, the majority of genetic counselors are certainly female. Um, that is something that we're also trying to diversify um, as well in regards to gender. Um, I actually don't know the stats, but it's over 90% of, of the field is actually female. So I would say that that's completely fine. I, there wouldn't be any uh, hesitancy, I would say, or Gender questioning barriers. and re exactly gender barriers most certainly great well that's it's certainly interesting and I, I wonder you know what what leads you know the population um towards the, the field 
Um, another question we have reflects on, as you spoke about, you know, non-native English speakers, um, and one of our attendees tonight was pointing to a, a recent study um, from Brigham and Women's Hospital that really showed um, worsening COVID outcomes for Spanish-only speakers. Um, do you have any reflections on that or, or any thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that it, I think there's major factors that can attribute to it. I mean, certainly one, it's certainly a question mark to uh, that I even as as a professional have faced is some some patients certainly have hesitancies in regards to wanting to uh, um, go to the hospital, especially if depending on their insurance status um, to do, are they even insured? Are they documented? Are they not documented? Um, do they want to be part of the system if they're not documented? I think that's a major issue for individuals who are not native to, you know, to, to the United States. Um, and I would say that, you know, there's other factors that can attribute to it as well. You know, lifestyle, um, you know, typically there's multi-generational homes that these individuals live in, um, as well as, you know, other factors, most certainly that I can understand why the why the percentage may have been higher, most certainly. Um, and I'm genuinely not surprised because it's something that we see a across not only COVID, but certainly in other areas, such as heart disease and even cancer, you know, uh, risks or percentages of, of cancer diagnoses, most certainly. Thank you. I know that healthcare disparities in healthcare is certainly something that's of interest to, to many people in the, in the health professions and certainly something we at Jefferson are are hoping to close gaps on. Uh, the next question is a two-parter, um, but but hopefully not too complicated. But so, how is the ERA framework being implemented? And could you speak to some of the, some, if any, of the challenges that you and your colleagues have faced bridging the gap with with that work? I think the hardest. I, I'll answer the second one because I am currently experiencing right now. Uh, I think it's. I think part of it is also generational. I'm going to be honest. Um, there are more seasoned professionals who have certain mind frames that feel that they may don't feel like they need to change. And I think it's, I think it's changed. I think we have to take away the comfort for, for individuals and realize that this, this is an issue that's existed for many years and we have to create this change. I've certainly uh, no doubt have had some setback um, or pushback, I should say, in regards to this concept of era, um, which is, I would say, has been a little bit difficult in regards to um, other, I, I mean, essentially other individuals being open to, to the idea of it and the framework. Um, but I think if, it's, if we're, we're, we're constantly reaching out to people and I mean, not only within the genomic technology SIG, we've worked with certainly JCRJ, which is a student-led organization about racial despair, racial injustice um, that we're collaborating with to, to implement these, these frameworks um, that can hopefully be, be pushed into um, not only with our American Board of Genetic Counselors, but certainly with the organizations in regards to the genetic pro graduate programs themselves. Um, I am, we're essentially advertising the, a concept of ERA. If you guys go to NSGC, whoever is a genetic counselor in here, um, my plot, I did have an, a presentation accepted for it. So I will be talking about the framework. So hopefully more people can hear about it and be able to implement it. And I think there's different ways to implement it. And I think it's perfect for genetic counselors within various areas in gen, um, within genetic counseling. There are some that are focused more in academia and I think education and recruitment certainly play a, a role. I mean, all the era itself plays a role in different areas from into GCs who are part of industry to research, to clinic, to even education. Um, so there's different ways that it can be implemented um, most definitely. And do you have any advice for, for genetic counselors who are wanting to implement ERA, but maybe have little experience working with diverse populations themselves? I think that's a major challenge, especially um, depending on locations at which these genetic counselors work. Um, but I think it's more of, you know, you know, checking with yourself of, 
you know, what do you think you feel like you can be part of? I don't, I don't think that this should be like all of these actions and tasks should be forced on, on someone, but it's more of what do you feel like you're capable of doing to say that you've, you've helped with this initiative and this change within the field. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be working with, you know, you know, I think d- the defining a diverse group can, can certainly vary. I mean, if you have a genetic counselor who's in the rural community, location is a major barrier for you. So how can you decrease the, the, the issue of someone having access to genetic services, having to drive three hours for genetic services? Like, is there a way to host webinars? Things like that in regards to, you know, or telemedicine efforts, I would say, or, you know, in, in regards to decreasing those type of barriers. I'm just using that as an example. Sure. Um, Mm-hmm. Excellent. And, and, and yes, important. Um, another attendee is, is curious about your thoughts on the commercialization of genetic health testing, things like 23andMe. Do you think it's helping to gather more information about differences in ethnicities? Um, is it limited to higher income, higher educated individuals? Um, what are your thoughts as a, as a scientist? I think that one, what I can appreciate from 23andMe and other directed uh, to consumer testing companies is that they've created awareness about genetic testing and people, you know, wanting to learn more about genetics. Because before there was certainly like, well, I don't want to know this information. Why am I going to do this? And now with ancestry, especially with ancestry testing, they want to know more about their background, which is certainly like kind of sparked a something for them to want to know more about their family history and, and things like that. But um, limitations I have with them are in just regards to the science behind it. Um, I'm not a little, I'm not for it exactly. Um, I shouldn't say that because this is recorded. (laughs) Um, But I, I would hope that, but my concern as well as with individuals who, you know, if they proceed with direct to consumer testing, it's more of, are they able to interpret and understand these results, especially if they're doing some form of health screening? And I think that's where a genetic professional needs to come in to help them understand this information as well as not only, and certainly what the benefits and, and limitations are in regards to testing overall. That's helpful. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, another one of our attendees who has shared that, that they are um, themselves an immigrant um, is curious about your thoughts and and any hopes or goals that you think um, are achievable for for access to things like vaccination and healthcare for the, the those who are undocumented. I mean, I f- I feel like it has to be a a, a grassroots um, initiative. You know, it it has to be us going into the community and talking to individuals uh, about this. It's it it's not posting things on TV and, and things like that. It, it has to be, you know, going and, you know, talking at churches or community centers where people essentially where people feel comfortable to, to discuss information with one another. And certainly with COVID, I was going to say where people congregate, like they don't really go there right now because of the pandemic. But um, I think those are different ways in regards to, to decreasing those barriers. And also, I think it's important, especially um, in my family experiences myself, there was a lot of hesitancy hesitancy for individuals to obtain the vaccine. And my mother was actually the first in the family um, to receive the vaccine. And she actually was on the local news for it because she was the first in her hospital as well to also one of the first in the hospital to get it. And I was so happy that she did that because that created awareness that yes, individuals that look like me are, are getting this vaccine. And that creates that trust that I said earlier with the community of them wanting to do this. If they see others doing it of their, essentially their kind, um, that they feel more comfortable essentially. And I think it, it, it's those moments and those, those steps that need to take place for, for that to happen, for, for that awareness and, and that a desire and want to obtain the vaccine. Thank you. Um, uh, Another comment and question from one of our attendees um, who says that they think it's important to communicate the admixture of of all of our genetic makeups and and 
And he asks, how can genetic counseling associations get that message out more effectively? Um, I mean, that's something that we're, we're, we're certainly striving to do as well within the NSGC, National Society of Genetic Counselors. Um, I mean, we, there, I think was a big thing that's helped us that I feel like we didn't have 10 years ago with social media. Um, you know, we constantly, you know, are, are, you know, try to discuss or, you know, uh, provide information to individuals through like Twitter. Um, there's an app called Clubhouse that is amazing, where it's a platform for not only healthcare professionals, but the average Joe or Jane who knows not much about anything with genetics, where people can go into this room and have this discussion about different topics about genetics. And I feel like that, I feel like is a blessing through, during this pandemic that this, that, that type of platform was created um, because it's able to create that awareness overall. But things like that, I feel like are, are certainly advantages, most certainly. Okay. Um, and, and one of our attendees asks if, if the society is working with any other professionals, organizations outside of genetic counseling so that to bring these best practices across healthcare. Yeah, um, I, so yes, um, there are different um, organizations for students part of, like that are part of um, STEM, most certainly that we're trying to collaborate with, and most certainly um, with ACMG, American College of Medical Genetics, as well as other organizations within genetics, um, the field of genetics, because um, I mean geneticists are also in a play role too. Um, that we're trying to to work together in unity, essentially. Thank you. And then I think. Um... Another question that came in from somebody in advance of the program, and if you if you feel comfortable reflecting on it, is how can someone become a better ally to the Latinx community um, and to, to other underrepresented communities? Um, in your opinion, I I think it's a, I think it's important when 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 someone says they want to be an ally, it's and I understand why individuals to say like, oh, I, I'm, I'm nervous. I don't know what to do. And it's no one knows what we're doing exactly. We, there's no, there's no set path for us. We're, we're trying to figure things out as they go. And I, I think that's important to realize that you, like someone saying, I want to be an ally is great enough for me to say, to think that that's great. You, we have someone on our side that's trying to, to, to help overall. And I think what's important as individuals who aren't allies is not not only creating or having these discussions with individuals of my of minority or diverse backgrounds, but also creating this conversation with other individuals too, where the topic may not typically come come up, and and creating that that dialogue for people to learn up and and realize what the what may be going on. Creating this topic of discussion overall, I think, is a great way to kind of start um, to or be part of. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, if there are no other questions, I'm not seeing any additional questions from our attendees. So I want to just really thank you most sincerely, Joanna. And again, congratulations on being named the JCLS Early Career Alumni Award recipient this year. Uh, we look forward to actually celebrating you in person, um, hopefully very soon. Um, and I also want to take a moment to thank the members of the College of Life Sciences Alumni Association Board, and especially the Alumni Awards Committee for their work um, this year and every year in helping to narrow down and, and select each year's award recipients. We also want to thank everyone who has joined us this evening. Um, we are, are very thankful for your time and we want to invite you um, to help us toast the class of 2021. Um, you should Check your email inbox and you should have received an invitation to share some words of congratulations and encouragement with this year's graduating class, which we'll then share as part of a toast to the class in a couple of weeks. You can also email a brief video um, to be included with to us at alumni at jefferson.edu. If you haven't already, we hope you'll get connected in our brand new Jefferson Alumni Network at alumni network.jefferson.edu. There you can activate your profile and search the alumni directory for 
classmates and colleagues and folks in your area. We also hope you'll join us for a number of our upcoming virtual programs, including next week, when Dr. Dan Powell, our Distinguished Alumni Award recipient, will continue our JCLS alumni celebration um, with his lecture on Thursday, um, April 29th. Follow, the following week, we will have our Celebration of Innovation, and it's a two-night celebration of our innovative students and innovators in the university community. So we hope you'll also join us. You can find a full schedule of upcoming alumni events at jefferson.edu slash alumni events. Thank you all again. Thank you again, Joanna. Have a great evening and take care. Thank you all. Have a great night. You're the best. <laughs>